Hillsborough Inlet Lighthouse. This was constructed between 1905 and 1907. The date on the door is 1906, but in fact, the, late, the lighthouse was placed in service in March 1907. Just why was a lighthouse built at Hillsborough Inlet? For the answer to that question, we must look into the past and out to sea. The Gulf Stream, a warm, powerful current running north, is just offshore from the South Florida coast. Ships heading south must hug the coast to avoid its opposing current, forcing the ship's masters to navigate very carefully to avoid South Florida's wicked reefs. Since the time of the old Spanish galleons, so many ships have run aground in the area that a wrecking industry became one of the most lucrative trades among early settlers of South Florida and the Florida Keys. Many of the area's most wealthy families gained their wealth by salvaging the cargoes of doomed ships. In response, the government established houses of refuge along the coast with resident keepers to house stranded sailors. And they began building a network of lighthouses to help ships' navigators to safely find their way through the maze of reefs. In 1825, the U.S. Lighthouse Establishment first built several lighthouses in the Florida Keys, followed by one on the South Florida mainland at Cape Florida on Key Biscayne. The Cape Florida Lighthouse has the distinction of being the oldest structure in South Florida. However, 1825 was a very dangerous time to build anything on the Florida mainland. The Seminole Indians in the area were between wars and living with an uneasy treaty. Ten years after the lighthouse went into service, the Second Seminole War broke out and its full fury arrived at Cape Florida late in the afternoon of July 23, 1836, giving it the added distinction of being the only lighthouse ever to be attacked by Indians. The head keeper, John DuBose, was away on leave in Key West with his family to celebrate his birthday. He had left assistant keeper John Thompson and an old black man, Aaron Carter, to watch the light. Suddenly a war party of about 50 Seminoles appeared from the brush, muskets blazing. The two men locked themselves in the lighthouse and fired back at the Indians. The attackers set fire to the door of the lighthouse, igniting the barrels of whale oil stored in the base. Thompson and Carter climbed up to the lantern, but the fire followed them up the wooden staircase and forced them out on the watch gallery, where they were easy targets. A final hailstorm of Indian musket fire immediately wounded Thompson and killed Carter. In an attempt to blow out the fire, Thompson threw a keg of gunpowder down the tower. The blast was heard by a ship at sea that came to his rescue. However, burned and wounded, he was to spend another agonizingly hot July day at the top of the lighthouse before his rescuers could get him down. Cape Florida remained dark following the Indian attack until 1846, when it was relighted. But yet another war loomed in the future of the old lighthouse, and in 1861, Civil War rebels, described by the keepers as a band of lawless persons, destroyed the illuminating apparatus, leaving Cape Florida dark again until 1866. It remained in service until 1878, when it was replaced by this lighthouse at Fowey Rocks. Roughly 100 miles north of the Cape Florida Lighthouse, the government built the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse. Completed in 1859 at the mouth of the Jupiter River, this lighthouse guides shipping past yet another treacherous reef between the Gulf Stream and the South Florida coast. Jupiter's reef posed a tremendous obstacle to Florida's coastal shipping. Congress recognized this in 1853 and authorized $35,000 for building a lighthouse at Jupiter Inlet. George Gordon Meade, who would achieve greater fame as the victorious commanding general of the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg, designed the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse as a young lieutenant in the Army Bureau of Topographical Engineers. Meade's plan called for a brick tower 90 feet high. It was later changed to 105 feet. It had an iron stairway and was furnished with a flashing Fresnel lens. Construction began in 1854 but difficulties with getting building materials to the site, stinging mosquitoes, and again, problems with the local Indians delayed construction. The delays drove the cost up to $60,000, nearly twice the original allocation. 
Since Jupiter Inlet was closed, the workers had to bring all of the building materials in through the Indian River Inlet. Then using scows, they had to float everything down 35 miles of a narrow, tortuous, shallow river with a depth of no more than 20 inches. The shallow water limited each scow trip to 10 tons, requiring 50 trips. Then the government chose the highest point of land in the area to build the lighthouse, and that just happened to be an ancient Indian shell mound, considered holy by the Seminoles. So the Indians regularly harassed the builders. Construction practically drew to a halt during the Third Seminole War, which lasted from 1856 to 1858. The first keeper ignited the lamp, which stands 146 feet above the sea, on July 10, 1860 and the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse began its long, proud history. During the Civil War, Confederate sympathizers removed the lighting apparatus, as they did to all Federal lighthouses in the South, to confuse northern naval ships. They hid the lens in Jupiter Creek, where it rested until 1866. After the Civil War ended, the government sent an agent to Jupiter, and with the help of a local coastal pilot, Captain James Armour, they recovered the lens intact. On June 28, 1866, the light again flashed out over Jupiter Inlet. Congress rewarded Captain Armour with a keeper's position at the lighthouse where he remained for 40 years, one of the longest periods of service at one lighthouse on record. The tower was originally natural brick, but the keepers painted it red in 1910, the color it is to this day. The 1928 hurricane blew out one of the bullseye lenses and knocked out the power generator. In the tradition of the service, the keeper's son climbed the tower and turned the lens by hand throughout the stormy night. The head keeper, Captain Seabrook, salvaged every piece of the broken eye and shipped them to Charleston, where they were painstakingly put back together with bars across them, as they stand today. A tiny cemetery containing several keeper's children stands as mute, sad evidence of the difficulties of life in primitive Florida before the days of yachts, highways, and condominiums. A time not so very long ago, when Florida was young, wild, and even dangerous. A time when even the mail had to be carried from Jupiter Inlet to Miami by foot. They were known as the Barefoot Mailmen, and they became colorful legends of their time as they actually carried the mail to each tiny settlement along South Florida's coast by walking along the beach in the late 1800s. This, the most lonely of all mail routes, presented many challenges. The rugged carriers found resting places and spent their nights at the occasional houses of refuge. They kept rowboats dragged up on the sand at South Florida's many river inlets. On October 11, 1887, barefoot mailman Jim Hamilton arrived at the lonely Hillsborough Inlet and found his boat tied up on the opposite shore. There was only one thing to do. Jim stripped off his clothes, dropped his mailbag beside them, waded out into the inlet, and swam into history. James E. Hamilton was never seen again. Investigators reported alligators in the vicinity of the inlet, but sharks often swim into the inlet searching for small fish. He could have simply been caught by the current and swept out to sea. Whatever happened to Jim Hamilton remains a mystery. Had there been a lighthouse at the inlet with keepers on duty, perhaps his story would have ended quite differently. But only the mute early residents of Hillsborough Inlet were there to witness the event. There would have been a lighthouse at Hillsborough on that fateful day, had Congress acted on the recommendations of the Lighthouse Board. Two years earlier, in 1885, the Board had begun its annual appeal to Congress for $90,000 to build a lighthouse here. But for 16 long years, the appeals fell on deaf ears. Perhaps Jim's untimely death was not in vain, but added even more pressure to the need for a lighthouse at Hillsborough. South Florida was already bulging at the seams with growth and changing into the world's vacation playground that we know today. In 1896, Flagler pushed his railroad into Fort Lauderdale, which had grown into a bustling community of over 100 persons with its own school. The city of Miami was growing ever larger. Top sails or the smoke from steamers was always in sight on the ocean, and many of those ships found their way onto the reefs between Hillsborough and Fort Lauderdale. This was obviously due to the dark transit between Cape Florida, 40 miles to the south, and Jupiter Inlet, 
50 miles to the north. Further, more and more small boats were using the sandbar-filled inlet for access to and from the ocean. Finally, in February 1901, Congress approved a first order light at or near Hillsborough Point at a cost not to exceed $90,000. The lighthouse board surveyed the site, paid the two owners of the land $150 each for their parcels, and developed the design for the lighthouse. Russell Wheel and Foundry of Detroit, Michigan cast all of the parts in Detroit and shipped them individually to Hillsborough Point by steamer. In Hillsborough, J. H. Gardner, a New Orleans contractor, put the parts together like a gigantic erector set. All of the parts had numbers, and each had to go in its exact place. The lighthouse that they built was beautiful. It was graceful and light, yet strong and durable. When the, uh, the lighthouse was built in 1903 to 1907, the first step was to dig a circle down through about six feet of sand to the hard bottom shoal, which was located about six feet below the present surface. Then they drilled holes in the rock, which was a, a very soft, tough rock a mixture of calcium carbonate and cemented sand. They drilled holes in there, set bolts into the holes. I think they screwed them in, uh, as they have done on what's called the screw pile lighthouses. Then they cast concrete blocks under each of these eight supports. Cast those blocks up to about a height of five feet. Then they had a big foundation in the center that supports the nine-foot diameter central column, and there was a very small foundation that supported the outer edge of the stairs. When they finished that, uh, they, the wooden forms were held until the cement was really hard, really hardened. As they were Pouring the concrete, they set bolts in the top of the foundations. And we can show those right over here. The bolts in the top of the foundations came up and went through the foundation castings. There's eight of these foundation castings, and they're actually held with these big washers and nuts locked right down to the concrete base. Um, what is interesting is that at the time of construction, where I am standing was about 18 inches above ground level. And in the years since, it has all filled in. These horizontal pipes running from foundation to foundation were about 18 inches above ground level. And it looks like it's all one piece, but it's not. This is a foundation casting. This is a pipe that went into the casting and carries the weight of the tower. So all, all these vertical members, all the way up 140 feet, are in compression. There was a tower somewhat like this built on a place called Minot's Ledge off Boston, and they did not use diagonal braces on Minot's Ledge. And what happened was that the whole upper tower went back and forth like this in the storm, and in only a year and a half, these members snapped off. So they found it was extremely important to have diagonal members from their cross pinned here they go up, and these are solid iron rods, and you can see they're locked in the center, and they go that way. 
So these are in compression, the diagonal members are in tension, and the combination makes a very rigid setup. In other words, no matter which way the wind comes, the compression and the tension lock it, so it moves very, very little, even in a heavy storm. In 1926, the uh, keeper was up in top of the lighthouse for 32 hours, and he estimated that it was moving two or three feet. But even that, in a height of 140 feet, is not much motion. And this tower has endured for 90 years in this location. We had two devastating hurricanes in the 1920s. The first was in 1926, shortly after the lighthouse was electrified, the keeper was up in the tower 32 hours. The waves were so heavy that they washed all the sand away and exposed this much of the foundation. All the sand from here out was gone. And they tried desperately because Florida has lost a number of lighthouses due to erosion under the foundations. They tried desperately to stabilize with wood, with sand, nothing worked until between 1929 and 1930. They installed this 260 foot breakwater they call a groin and it has uh, Georgia granite blocks. Uh, these are the typical blocks, they're a ton and a half a piece uh, the technical term is cyanite, S-Y-R-A-O-N-I-T-E, but it's called Georgia granite, and you can see where it was blasted and uh, made in uh, Georgia, trucked down and placed 260 feet running from the base of the lighthouse to the ocean. That has stabilized, and the sand has gradually built up over the years since 1930, stabilizing this point of land. Captain Alfred Berghill served as the first head keeper of the Hillsborough Lighthouse. Berghill arrived on the station during construction and served from 1907 until Thomas Knight relieved him on August 1, 1911. Keeper Knight moved his family to this station from his last assignment at the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse. Tom's brother Eugene, a salty old sea captain known as Cap, had spent most of his life on the high seas. When Eugene retired, he opened a restaurant on an island just north of Hillsborough Inlet and named it Club Unique. The island was the perfect location for the old seaman. His restaurant could only be reached by boat. Legends abound concerning Cap's involvement with smuggling, rum running, and other shady activities. During Prohibition, Club Unique became a speakeasy where drinkers could slake their thirst outside of the law. Local gamblers paid 25 cents for a lifetime membership in Cap's private gambling club. And by 1951, Captain Eugene Knight had signed up 8,000 gamblers. No one knows exactly when people began referring to the restaurant as Cap's place, but that's what it finally became. Its colorful proprietor lived out his days sitting in his favorite chair in the kitchen, wearing his trademark bib overalls, spinning yarns, and telling his endless stories of the sea. His waitresses worked barefoot through the 60s until local health department rules actually forced them to wear shoes. Cap's Place has now become a historical landmark. It has some of the last natural foliage in the area, and you can still only get there by boat. Hillsborough's next head keeper presents us with a baffling mystery. A bronze plaque on the station lists all of the head keepers. According to the plaque, Captain Judge Becton Isler assumed command in 1920, thus replacing Tom Knight. However, their daughters, Ruth Isler, Mary Knight, and Zora Isler, clearly remember their fathers working side by side through the bootleg era of the 20s and into the population explosion of the 30s. The three women paid a historical visit to the station in 1976 and all had wonderful memories of being children growing up at the Hillsborough Lighthouse Station. I remember in the early 20s the beach road was only a gravel road that led to the beach area 
and the road north was a rutted sand road that ended here at the inlet. All of us children learned to swim at an early age. We were always in the water. We all had learned how to row a boat. We'd go up and down the canal. You know how kids are, always exploring. And because we swam so much, we didn't have to take a bath very often. When we did, usually in the wintertime, a mother would heat the water on the stove and pour it into a number two wash tub. We'd giggle our heads off as we'd take a bath together. The children at the lighthouse station did have to go to school. If there were nine children, the government would build a school and hire a teacher. There were three keepers' cottages constructed between 1905 and 1907. And of those the three, two of them are still here. Uh, they were designed using the technology of the uh, called the Houses of Refuge, designed to stand on exposed coasts. And <clears throat> if you look carefully, you can see the roof comes down like a shoebox over the first story. And there's actually second story windows in there you can't see. But the idea was to make a building that was very, very strong and could withstand hurricanes. And these have. They've withstood hurricanes for 90 years. When they electrified the station in the 1920s, they only needed two keepers. And so the third station, third house, was declared surplus and was sold to the Hillsborough Club next door and moved over into that location on the beach. And what's interesting historically is that then the pattern of modification was different between the houses which remained on station and under Coast Guard control and the ones which became one which became private and uh, has slightly different changes made to it. Seventy-five steps. Yeah. They're small little steps. Yeah, and it's double wall. There's about a uh, three-inch gap. Oh yeah. Pretty little brackets. Yeah. The stairs are numbered between landings.
10, 11. So there's only 11 steps between landings here. Yeah. This is the uh, pulley yeah. that they hoist stuff. And that's all new. It was an old wooden block six months ago. Was it? Yeah. And it just ties around that beam. That's all there is to it. Huh? Yeah. This is the uh, beautiful clamshell type Fresnel lens, which represented the very latest in optical technology at the turn of the century. The lens is composed of 356 pieces of optical glass. The most complex is the central bullseye, which is split in half. But while it looks like many pieces, it's only two pieces of glass, which was cast and then polished for weeks to give it smoothness and the ability to focus the spherical rays from the uh, lantern into a horizontal beam along this focal path. Then there are some uh, segments of brass retainers and they're machined to hold hundreds of pieces of optical glass. They're all triangular in shape, slightly curved, and again, polished to refract the light so that the light coming off the lens strikes these and comes out in a horizontal beam. The end result is a uh, horizontal beam of tremendous strength and range. When this uh, light was originally lit in March 1907, uh, they used a, it was called an IOV lantern, very much like a modern Coleman lantern. Uh, it had an asbestos mantle, and the kerosene was vaporized and burned with a brilliant white light in the mantle. And that beam, then the rays come out in a spherical pattern, this lens focused them into a horizontal beam equivalent to 550,000 candles. Uh, the beam on a good night could be seen almost 15 miles at sea. And when was this little twister put in? Uh, apparently, uh, the gears wore out about 1988. And, uh, when they went to repair them, they discovered that uh, you know, 80 years of sun had evaporated a lot of the mercury and had poisoned the atmosphere up in here. So they had a, a crisis situation that the atmosphere in here was unsafe for repairing the uh, turning mechanism for this huge 9-foot diameter Fresnel lens. And at the same time, they had to get it working again in a hurry. And so the solution was to install a rotating airport type beacon uh, mounting it on the seaward side of the uh, lantern gallery. And for the past, almost past 10 years, the light from the Hillsborough Lighthouse has actually come from that small rotating airport beacon rather than the huge lines. It's got a little miniature frame now in it. Yeah. Yeah. When the lighthouse went in service in March 1907, the appearance from this observation gallery was very different. There was a long spit of sand extending about 600 feet out towards the ocean. There was a very narrow, deep channel on the Hillsborough Inlet side of the lighthouse, and there was no cut through the first reef. So for the first, uh, really, 40 years, 
the only way for deep draft vessels to get into the dock at the lighthouse or get in through Hillsborough Inlet was to come in what was called the back door. And that was to come inside the reef, way down the beach, and sail up parallel to the beach, and then come up to the dock. So inside of that white water there? Inside of the white, the white water is the reef. And the two vessels approaching uh, the reef right now, uh, one of them is a commercial fishing vessel, the other is a sport fishing vessel. But they're going through a cut that was made in the reef or hard bottom shoal uh, during the 1960s. And until that cut was made, uh, there was only three or four feet of water at best over the reef. The inlet is extremely restless and requires regular dredging to keep it open for the busy traffic of ocean-going yachts and fishing boats. In its natural state, the inlet fills with sandbars. Many old-timers recall wading all the way across the inlet as children. In the 1950s, local charter boat captains and crews actually waded into the inlet and dug out a channel by hand at low tide. In the 1960s, the Hillsborough Inlet Commission built a strong 400-foot jetty opposite the lighthouse, composed of heavy wooden beams bolted together and reinforced with granite boulders. They began dredging operations that continue to this day. This current dredge is 26 years old. It began working on the inlet in 1984 and toils away at the shifting bottom every day. The dredge's power plant is dedicated to moving sand from the inlet onto the beach. It has no power to move itself and no propeller. It moves by having its workboat crews place anchors. Then the dredge's captain hauls in or pays out the anchor cables to move from one position in the inlet to another. It is hard work and the next nor'easter shifts the bottom all around again. The lighthouse patiently watches over all of these bustling ongoing activities with equanimity. With the passing of the years, this old sentinel has seen many changes at the inlet. If it could speak, I wonder if the lighthouse would be pleased. Would it delight in being at the center of South Florida's exciting development? Would it be proud of being the landmark for the parade of passing yachts and fishing boats? Or would it long for its days of isolation when little girls ran to dip the station's flag at the passing of an occasional boat? When it looked down on a sandy road to the beach that ended here at the inlet? And when its cottages rang with the laughter of the keepers and their children?